So again, just I guess to go back to and reinforce what we were talking about there a couple of weeks ago. This is one of the macro things that, Luther, that fascinates Luther. And he talks about it in context after context, decade after decade. How God comes to us in hidden ways. Wearing masks, asking for faith, also then giving us the faith that we need in order to see him at work in those places. Because without faith, you would not think that God was there, right? You would just think it's the police officer, or you would just think um, it's a dead guy on a tree, or, you know, in the case of Christ, right? Nice guy, but, you know, met lots of nice guys before, or it's just a little bit of water. What can that possibly do, right? Or it's just a little bit of bread. Actually, is it even bread? <laughs> that's well, unleavened. Whole, but that's yeah. another whole topic. Pardon? So, well, it's unleavened. It's unleavened. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. For the last days. Yeah, yeah. With faith, right? We see God behind the masks, doing His good work there. But unless and until we come to see that, it just kind of looks silly. So. Ideally, the two kingdoms not only work together, but they depend on each other. And Luther develops this in an interesting way, too. Um, on the one hand, the kingdom of Christ depends on the civil government uh, in several different ways, right? Um, the church needs peace to do its work. Now, I realize that's arguable, right? Yeah. When you think about the sayings, you know, there's no atheists in a foxhole, right? <laughs> or when you think about how the church often prospers under persecution, you know, um, how the church managed to survive in North Korea and in Cambodia and in the USSR and in the concentration camps. Um, you know, then you realize, well, it's not always true that the church needs peace to do its work. No. But, <laughs> in terms of the ease with which the church does its work. Peace is a blessing. And so again, just picking up on that alone, we do depend on, we do depend upon the government. Right? It is a blessing to us, also in the right hand kingdom. Um, civil government has to use force, and guess what? That's not something that God has given us to use. The only thing He's given us to use in the church is the gospel. And that doesn't force anybody to do anything. When it comes to force, we got nothing. That's what the left hand kingdom is for. I didn't know what this piece of machinery was, that's why I put the thing on the bottom. I was looking for, I thought you still had to um, first plow your field and then come by with the seed drill to plant, but I learned in looking for a picture for this, this is why these things take me so long to put together, because I keep diving down these rabbit holes. But I realized, no, they don't actually do that anymore. Now they do it like this. Did you know this? At least if you're cutting edge, this is what you do. You In one pass, you cut the cover, and you do no-till seeding. So I was looking for pictures of things that, couldn't, that didn't exist anymore. That's why I couldn't find it. Anyway, that's a little bit of a digression. But the dependence of the church on the government, and conversely, so, haha, flip the picture around, uh, civil government also depends on the kingdom of Christ. Now, isn't this an interesting one? The church creates citizens who are good citizens in different ways. Hmm, is this true for us? The gospel creates the, the new self, which is eager to do good. Does that make us good citizens? I think so. I think so. I mean, yes, we're also still in the flesh and old self and that part. Well, yeah, I do like to drive a little fast, I admit. Um, but, you know, insofar as the new self has something to say about it, I, I do seek to obey the law. And the government, I hope, appreciates that. Um, the new self does not reject the law, but it knows that the law serves God's purpose, right? 
doesn't mean I'm happy when I get a speeding ticket, you know, but I do recognize, yeah, it is a good thing that we have laws and enforcement of laws. Um, if you visited countries where the law is not enforced, um, it doesn't take long to figure out that that's actually an awful lot worse than having a government that does enforce the law, right? The new self teaches us this at a deep level. And the church helps the authorities, again, ideally, right? To preserve peace and order by instructing Christians about God's will and by teaching obedience, morals, discipline, and honor. Is that what the church does? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, right? Should, not as our primary mission, but insofar as we also still live in the world and are in a world where God is at work also through his left-hand kingdom, not just through his right-hand kingdom. Yeah, absolutely, we can support that left-hand kingdom of God in all these ways. Okay. Even so, these kingdoms are not equally important and should not be blended together. Um, thinking about this left-hand, right-hand stuff is useful in this regard. Um, and i got a whole kind of a little couple sentences here. Left-hand. Um, how many of you are left-handed? Anybody here no, tonight? I, I, was, okay. I was born left-handed, forced to use my right hand, and uh, tied my hand behind my back. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. All right, you're a convert then. <laughs> now Forced I, convert. Yeah. For a while I could write with either. But now I can't write with either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, okay. I mean, some people are left-handed, right? So the, the things that are associated here with left and right, for them, doesn't work. I'm sorry, you know, we live in a right-hand dominant world, and so sort of the shading of the left and right thing uh, reflects that. But... Given that bias, you know, left hand, yeah, it's still God, but it's not his preferred way of working, right? It's like, have you, have you broken your right hand or cut it badly or something where you've had to do things with your left? It, just, it doesn't work as good, does it? You know, it's still you doing it, um, but it doesn't come out as, sad, as well. It's not as satisfying. It's just not the way you're really wired to work, right? Can you see how that maybe helps us understand these two different ways of God working too. No. He doesn't really like to punish people. He doesn't really like to carry a big stick, right? Um, he'd much rather rule everybody with grace and love and mercy and just pass over their sin on account of Christ. But no, because the world is corrupt and the devil is raging and we have a sinful nature, he still needs to operate with force. And so he does. But it's his foreign work, his strange work, his uh, theological term is his opus alienum, his foreign work. He does it because he has to, not because it makes him glad. But he does promise to keep us safe, and, and yes. he cares about us. So yes. It, it, it's like a parent. Sometimes you gotta do the tough love thing. Exactly, exactly. That's right. That's right. Yes, yes. We we know this in our families, right? Yeah. The parent. I remember when my dad said that years ago. Oh, he's probably watching this recording or something. <laughs> remember that, Dad? <laughs> this hurts me more than it hurts you. Like, at the time, you think you're not even close, right? <laughs> but but when you become a parent. You realize, yeah, I don't want to do this. It does rip me up. But I know I have to. That's left-hand kingdom stuff. Right-hand kingdom, on the other hand, this is where we see God at his best, right? This is speaking his natural language, using his dominant hand. He doesn't have to think about it. He just does it. This is what he delights to do. It's his opus proprium. The thing that he was made to do. It's his character. Again, think back session one, right? What kind of a God is he? He's a God who forgives and has compassion and mercy and grace. That's how he's wired to work. 
And that's what the, we mean when we say this is his right hand stuff too, right? Just a lot easier for him and better. Better for us too. So they do work together though, left and right. Uh, right and left are another way to think about it, um, Christ and reason. So here Luther says, in the office of preaching, Christ does the whole thing by his spirit, right? Right hand kingdom. But in the worldly kingdom, people must act on the basis of reason, right? So we have parliaments to reason out what are the best laws. And we have courts where you can argue using reason about whether that was a right thing to do or a wrong thing to do, right? And so we use reason in science and we apply logic when we mark papers and all these kinds of things. That's all good stuff to do, necessary things to do. Um, God's work, too. None of which brings us any closer to the kingdom of God. Right? I cannot, by my own reason or understanding, can you come to help me out here? Yes, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to Him. But how do we get to Him then? By the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel and enlightened me with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps me in the one true faith. Right? There you've got the two things recognized in that formulation as well. There's a place for both. They're just not doing quite the same job. Interesting, you maybe noticed, this comes from a sermon on keeping children in school. Yeah, Luther was very interested in education and wrote letters and treatises and got after the rulers to put in place good schools for boys and girls, not just the boys, and teach them. Teach them everything they need to know. So another kind of nuance attached to this right and left is similar to thinking about the difference between the spiritual things and physical things, right? So here again, uh, well, no, this is from a different commentary in one of the Psalms. God made the sub secular kingdom subordinate, subject to reason, because it has no jurisdiction over souls or things of eternal value, but only over what? Physical and worldly goods. God, God places those under man's dominion, right? So we do ask the government to put in place laws and enforce them to protect my property, um, but I'm not interested in having the government tell me uh, what to believe about God. Right. Mm -hmm. right? That's right. not their turf. Wrong kingdom. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so ultimately, is the right hand kingdom better than the left hand kingdom? More important? More valuable? More weighty? Well, this is interesting. Secular power is only a very small matter in the sight of God. It matters so little to Him that here we are. <laughs> We should not resist, disobey, or argue about secular government. No matter what the state does, right <laughs> or wrong. <coughs> uh -huh. uh, Sir. Well, I know that uh, down in uh, America, U.S. of A., yeah. uh, they, so they got some really passionate Second Amendment people down there, and the Second Amendment basically says that um, you can resist and you should resist a, a, a tyr tyrannical government. Yep. Yep. So yep. Is that still bad or is that not so bad? Hang, hang on just a joke uh -oh. here. Just a joke. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I told you we were going to get to this, right? Oh, yeah. It's inevitable. We have to reckon with this. Are there no limits on on what Luther is saying here? Is he right to push it that far, right? You remember he said no matter what the state does, right or wrong. And that's when the questions start to fly, right? Really? Um, as it happens, those are not Lutheran clergymen shaking Hitler's hand. Thank God, <laughs> right? Yeah. They're Catholics. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but, are Lutherans, were Lutherans innocent of all of that? No. 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 Oh. <laughs> no way. 
Well, that's shorthand for for an awful lot of talk and, and writing, not just, I don't just mean chatter, but an awful lot of work has been done on the church under Hitler. And as you may know, much of the church did collaborate with Hitler. Well, because he used the church, though. He used the he church. Used, he manipulated it, so they're sinful, and then they did, you know, the time, not to excuse what they did not do or did do. Right. But they were right. used by a very... And some of the things that Luther said on various things, including yes. also things he wrote about the Jews, were used by the Nazis 400 years later for purposes that Luther never envisioned them being used to support. And so, for a variety of reasons, the sad truth is, though, that the church in Germany, partly, partly, and hear me stress, partly because of Luther's view of two kingdoms, was susceptible to being used. Because a tyrannical leader can take advantage of things like this and say, look it, this is what God is telling you. <laughs> right? There's a vulnerability here and a line that uh, can easily be crossed. This, in my context, is where the most heated conversation I've been part of uh, came up. Um, Paul Pope? Paul Pot? Do you know who he was? Oh, yeah. Dictator of yeah. Cambodia. Yeah. 1975 to 1979, the genocide there. And uh, one of the first LISA courses that I taught in that program in Southeast Asia was in Phnom Penh to Cambodian Lutheran pastors and deaconesses, and we were studying Romans. And so we got to Romans uh, 13 about obeying the government. That was the quote, one of the quotes we looked at earlier there, because he's God's that's the quote that you reacted to, actually, because he's God's servant to, uh, to, to enforce the good, right? Mm -hmm. My goodness, you know, I just step back and let them talk and discuss this because this was not a theoretical issue for them. You know, they were kids. Or some of them were adults, some of the older ones, when they had gone through that genocide. And so, you know, boy... That was a learning experience for me. It's one thing to say this in theory. Mm -hmm. Left hand kingdom, oh yeah, nice and tidy, beautiful, okay. schematic, right? Um, uh, and, until things go badly sideways and people start to die. And then you start to wrestle with this and say, there has to be a limit here, right? And, and, and when the government does not do the things the government is put in place by God to do, exactly. then what do we do, right? then do we just still continue to say, obey the government? No, it gets complicated. complicated. If the Try to vote them out, yeah. Vote them out. <laughs> if the government was to say that you could no longer be a Christian, then do you follow that government? That you're no longer allowed... You see, there's, there's, yeah. the, there's the nuances that come in. Yeah, exactly. And if exactly. the government is doing this kind That's of stuff, right. they're it's not evil. allowing you to be a Christian follower then. Yeah. And so yeah. you, can't, you can't follow that. You just can't. Yeah, that's our ultimate uh, allegiance is to God, to God, not to the government. And yeah. as you said earlier, in God's eyes, the government makes up a tiny little. It's there to maintain the peace. Well, he wasn't yeah. being very peaceful, was he? Neither was Hitler, neither was Stalin. Exactly. So right. you have to use that too. I mean, God gave us yeah. a brain to think as well. Yeah, yeah, that's not right. all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Some are well, a bare, a bare, <laughs> little brain, right? Yeah. Um, let me think. I'm just going to jump out of the show here for a sec, just to remind myself how much we have yet in this section. Oh, there's a little bit more. Yeah, okay. What? You want to take a break here? This is probably as good a place as any. Sure. We're not quite at the end of this section, but we're, we're getting close. Okay? Take 10? Take 10. Thank you. We, we do get it work. We're, we're streaming. We've got three people watching now. Um, we're still live. Okay. This camera will look. We're just going to let it run the way it is there. Okay. Some technical thing in between that box, the internet, and the computer. Oh, my. Um, yeah. So we troubleshoot a bunch of stuff. And, uh,
I'm not sure if any one thing fixed it or if it was yeah, a combination of some things. Yeah, yeah that's so probably okay. Just Thanks for hanging in with something us. Works. Yeah, you're like, which was the thing that works? Well, if you're doing spaghetti at the wall, one of the things is going great. Anyway, we're taking some things. You were here once before, I remember five years back. You know what? Oh, yeah, because remember in this group, they would probably get a bunch of people. Yeah, yeah, we're not sure what it was. We had a problem. We're going to adjust the cameras and the and the bit rate and have a transmission layer. Yeah, so you're going to ask like which one. I want to go. I start doing photography. Like the LCC ones, just like this very very short. They're usually just firing and turning off. Like that's what we've got. Hey, Mark. Yeah, so the biggest one done it about three times, uh, really? uh, but it, it's, still, uh, it's just just. And that was actually like uh, yeah. all the battery. So we're kind of get all the bright we'll do it as we're sitting there, we're looking at the mirror or whatever. There's a few yeah. where they. You know, you get into like uh, the more satire and memes and, and, memes and the same, same thing for like things. Yeah, everything a lot more sort of direct and unfiltered. So right? I think we yeah. rebooted this thing three times, that about six yeah. times. Yeah. 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 Transitional yeah. errors, um, it's usually a matter of one of the inputs is uh, yeah. Yeah. incorrect. Yeah. And it's not the same with transitions. If people come, people go. It's not really It's not set up properly. It's misaligned or something like that. You know, like usually, like, by the cameras in slot A, but this time by the cameras in slot C or something. Yeah. I think that's what we were checking, oh, because we unplugged everything and said, okay, we plug it all back in. Crazy. Camera's going there. Yeah. Camera's going there. Like, the computer's going here. Same as we've done before. Can, and it just kept fighting. Just fighting. Yeah. It would run for seven seconds. On the, on the well, it started to work out. Oh, yeah. Seven seconds. Oh, so I, I, was I was having a similar issue with my OBS, because um, I do streaming as well on Twitch. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 But um, on OBS on Twitch, I kept on getting this one error where it said uh, file path not supported. So literally, all I had to do was change the where the where the file would save to if I was saving the file. Right, right. But I was broadcasting; I wasn't recording video to save. So because uh, so I basically just had to go and select a random folder, yeah. and then once the random folder was selected, and it was just like it was okay. fine. Yeah. yeah, they get so sentimental. What could possibly go wrong? I mean, it's always the simplest thing, but yeah, yeah. you know, if it happened again. We probably do the same troubleshooting thing. We yeah. Shut it down first. We boot it all up. Make sure the connections are all there. We thought we had a loose connection. Mm -hmm. I, it just wouldn't jive. But we shut it all down. We booted it all up. Went through the whole process again, and it started working. Gotcha. gotcha. And it was just like, what? What are you doing? You guys have a really interesting setup. I. Okay. Yeah, I was away on Booker till they installed some of this stuff. Um, we used to use Adobe Connect. Uh, kind of my main, uh, main one, but uh, we've gone into a YouTube one. Uh, technically, YouTube should be easier to use than the Adobe Connect. I don't know if it's a little model, and it goes wrong. It really goes really wrong, and it just takes hours to fix it. YouTube, yeah, I don't know. It, it, uh, you know, I don't know. YouTube's not so bad. I like I said, I always stream on Twitch, so yeah. nothing easier. Yeah, nothing yeah. crazy there. It's but, always the little things that uh, yeah, that, that gets you on the way. But uh, but this little magic box here, uh, uh -huh. this is a, a hub for streaming. Yeah, it's the well they call it the webcaster X2 as you can see on there. It's uh, interesting. What it is it's doing right here, it gives us all the error codes and everything down in here. Okay. So now it tells us the streaming. Whereas we might have paused it at one time, but we're not going to. We're just going to let it run its course. Okay. Uh, we have one more of these next week. Um, so I'm not sure what, uh, you know, everything is tagged, everything is marked. You know, the first night we tried this, it didn't work. If we had horrendous problems with it to get it going. Last week, um, I wasn't here, but Josh was. Cause maybe it's me, Josh. Uh, last week, it worked quite fine. Turned it in, plugged it on, it was perfect. Everything was just okay. Yeah. Come in tonight, and you're trying to go, well, why is it not connected? Uh, funny how that works. Well, nothing's changed. Like, it's all the same. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah, it's just, just been, but I appreciate you coming up offering to help. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it's always, you always hate to see someone, a technical expert in the crowd. It's like, no, no, come over and help. Yeah. You know, well, we're not experts on this. Thing, but, uh, yeah, actually, it's funny because just the, uh, it was a couple months ago, there was a condo meeting uh -huh. uh, for the uh, AGM for the owners. Oh, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. I went there, and they were having our huge. Uh, hugely bad time trying to get their projector screen connected to the yeah, laptop, yeah, yeah. and I was like, "Have you tried, you know, function and then the display yeah, yeah. function and the display yeah. settings?" And they're like, "No." Nope. I was like, "Okay, do that." It worked right away. Yeah, yeah. So, See, it's those little things that yeah. you learn through experience. Save the day right? there. So, so. Yeah, well, I've got a couple of little tricks we can do there, but you know, at the end of the day, it was just no play. No, I'm good. No, I'm good. Grab yourself a coffee and something yeah. to eat there. Yeah, yeah. yeah.
Hopefully that'll keep running.
Yeah, when the conflict comes, um, we must obey God rather than men. That was the biblical answer. Yeah, that's what Luke was. <laughs> he said, I keep waiting for you to bring that in. <laughs> right. Time for class. <laughs> Story of your life. It's that. Yeah. So in this situation, do you have access to the left hand to drive? <laughs> yeah, good, good question. Are we, are we, which kingdom are we in here? Using the sword, are we? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The authority is vested in you. So I'm out with that. We're supposed to win base. <laughs> well, uh, hey, can I ask you a question, please? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of uh, Dr. Jordan or, B. Peterson? Uh, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, he's a pretty interesting person. Yes, have you, have yes any, he is. Have yeah, you ever uh, uh, read his book, uh, The Twelve? No, I haven't. No, uh, I, I've, I've read about, about it, that. but yeah. I've heard a lot about that book. I've been thinking yeah. about getting it, but I mean, not sure if I do, if I'm going to read it or not. Yeah, I, I think he's. I think he would that he's just. I think there's very good reasons why he's attracted a lot of buzz and you know, created a lot of interest because yeah, he's got some really good things to say. Yeah, very interesting. I enjoy watching his content on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, it's really cool listening to him uh, speak because yeah, it really uh, gets you thinking. Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Which guy? Are you mm -hmm. uh, Jordan B. Peterson. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, uh, he's over in Toronto somewhere. Yeah. Uh -huh. Ryerson. No. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone who would like another cup of coffee? Because the coffee's no. out, so the coffee is gone. It's, it's, uh, that's all you get. Sorry. It's so stimulating. Cup Nobody of needs at it. It's decaf, though. Is it? Yeah, it's decaf. Oh. Don't really that. Huh. I had a President Bugby said. Drinking decaf is like kissing your sister. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> no, you have no sister. <laughs> well, no, but I do actually. <laughs> Yeah, well, I yeah, okay. took a picture. Oh, that's, that's recorded, isn't it? Uh oh, oh boy. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's carry on here so we can uh, get as much of this in as we can before time expires. Um, yeah. One of the uh, one of the related issues that often comes up when we're thinking about these same uh, issues of how is God's kingdom related to the world. Uh, one of the paradigms that we often hear about is separation of church and state, right? And that's increasingly become part of our conversation, even here in Canada. I've noticed over the last couple decades. Um, but really, that has, has nothing to do with Canadian politics. But in the current context, it also has really nothing to do with Lutheran theology. Um, it's kind of a foreign paradigm in both respects for us as um, Canadian Lutherans. And uh, it comes from Thomas Jefferson. Um, he's the guy who coined this 
uh, the expression about the separation of it. So anyway, it's a long quote from him, but um, this is where Jefferson is coming from. Religion is a matter <clears throat> solely between man and God. Uh, the legitimate powers of government don't concern those things at all. The government only deals with actions, not opinions. And so he proposed um, a wall of separation between church and state. That's his phrasing. Um, and so the Lutheran approach is, is not that. It, it doesn't see separation between them, but rather, in a sense, a common goal under God. Whereas a Jeffersonian approach would say, yeah, God's over there, right? And we're over here. <laughs> and the one has really very little to do with the other, ideally nothing, if I'm understanding Jefferson correctly, and I'm certainly not an expert on him, um, or American political thought for that matter. But for Luther, anyway, um, he recognizes uh, that there's crossover here. There is. And it's a good thing when there is. If a preacher says to kings and princes and to all the world, thank and fear God and keep his commandments, Luther says he's not meddling in the affairs of secular government for a preacher to say that. Um, he's serving and being obedient to the highest government. Likewise, if a David or a prince teaches or gives orders to fear God and listen to his word, he's not acting as a lord of that word, but as a servant of it. If the government advises us, urges us to be godly, that's not a problem. Four, oop, with respect to God and in the service of his authority, everything should be identical and mixed together, whether it be called spiritual or secular. Interesting, huh? Well. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> Qualifications, having, right? Well, having the uh, overlap of if the government then steps into the role of being Control of the church and deciding what you should believe. Yeah, then yeah. There's a problem, and that's why yeah. I can see where, yep. with Jefferson's way of looking at it, it makes sense. But like you're saying, on the other hand, having the two working together is helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a yeah. line. Yeah, and see, Luther lived in a world where um, not only he, but other religious leaders too, other pastors, other Christians. Um, had the ear of the princes and um, used those relationships and connections that they had to influence the princes, to be godly princes. And some of the princes were, actually, right? So it was a different kind of world in which he was doing this thinking about the relationships than the world in which we live. You, you can't transfer it all just directly from 16th century Germany to 21st century yeah. Canada or Cambodia or yeah. 20th century Germany or whatever, right? The paradigms are, yeah, they're helpful models, but um, require adjustment. Yeah. If I could add just yeah, another please. observation. Sure. When we finished um, before going to break and we saw the poster of of um, Luther and, and yeah, the, the mustache, mustache yeah. And mm. basically, um, Hitler said, "Well, oh, you want to get to listen to him? This, this guy's on my side." That's right. And, and, yes. But boy, does that ever sound like the serpent in the garden of Eden? Didn't God say, "Blah blah blah blah"? Ah, yeah. yes. He You're right. You're right. You right. right. twist the yes. meaning to yes. suit himself. Yep. And and to me, seeing that, I went, "No, no, well, wrong." Yeah. <laughs> it just, yeah. It works for him, so he's going to use it. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. As, as you said to Kathy, right, the, um, yeah. about the, the National Socialists manipulating yeah. the church and controlling it. And mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's a, a very good book, which I didn't think to bring down, but it's called Lutherans Under Hitler. And, um, and there's another similar one, too. I can't remember the title of the other one, but um, a couple have come out in the last decade, both that one and the other one I'm thinking of, um, looking into this question and and producing a lot of evidence that um, that in fact the church really was manipulated and used um, and did resist that in some quarters more uh, uh, more effectively than others and um, more forcefully than in other quarters but in any case but our colleague 
Dr. John Helwig did his doctoral dissertation actually too on the church in Germany um, under uh, under the Nazis and how that was perceived in North America oh, yeah. yes. as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, some of you have probably heard him on that subject. So anyway, it's a it's a subject of great interest to see. And again, I guess that's the takeaway, right? Yeah. There's there's usefulness in this paradigm, but it can also be abused, as can all of God's good gifts, yes. right? Yeah. yeah, and you're right. The Satan uh, Satan twists them all. He does. Yeah, he did it to Jesus. <laughs> when he was trying to get him to, you know, yeah, to, you know, turn this rock into bread. And he's he yeah, yeah, he's had some experience with <laughs> the that, that guy. And, and the yeah. thing yeah. that is, I think he knows the Bible and, and uh -huh. as well uh -huh. as, and that's the thing, those that aren't paying attention <clears throat> right. and aren't questioning yes. are just being led away. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay, we're going to zip through this. So, yeah, the challenge is trust... <laughs> Here's the faith issue, right? That God is working in both kingdoms for our good. Um, can we always readily see that? Mm, well, with the eyes of faith, I think it's easier to see it. And that's one of the things that this paradigm challenges us to do. Um, it's not always easy. Luther said constantly, I, I must pound in, squeeze in, drive in, wedge in this difference between the two kingdoms even though it's written and said so often that it becomes tedious, right? Why? The devil never stops cooking and brewing them into each other and messing this whole thing up, right? So, secular leaders always want to be Christ's masters and teach him how he should run his church. And on the other hand, false priests and pastors always want to be the masters and teach people how to organize the secular government. So, you know, the devil is very busy on both sides. <laughs> Trying to make a hash out of all of this. Yeah. Okay, so that's kind of the segment on um, the two kingdoms itself. Now, how fast can I talk for the next 25 minutes? <laughs> to get through the next bit. Um, from a different angle, but related to this, Luther also rethought our individual places in the world. You notice so far... This has been looking at the macro level, the structural level, how God works in the world. And certainly that involves individuals, but that hasn't been the focus. Well, he also thought a great deal about us as individuals. And here, too, there's sort of a usual view, which he then thinks beyond and comes up with a different angle on it. The usual view, just what you might expect. God loved the sacred more than the secular, right? So... Look at all these pairs. Of course, God must love monks more than parents, right? Priests more than farmers, sure. Fasting more than feasting, well, that's the more holy thing, right? Offerings to the church, well, yes, just pass the plate now, right? More than gifts to your family. Monks over family. Holy orders over the, over the household. And this was the world in which Luther lived, right? Many people just assumed it was only the religious people who God had called to be his servants. So the assumption was if you serve God, you turn away from the world. And if you remain in the world, you're not working for God. A very binary way of looking at it, right? Well, when Luther got inside that <coughs> holy world of the monastery... Um, he came to realize that's not actually the case. <laughs> um, it's not that simple at all. And he had a lot of experience in the monastery, as you probably know, um, both as a you know an entry level novice and then as a priest, um, and teaching theology and completing his doctoral studies. All of that took place within that religious sphere, as opposed to the secular sphere. And he came to see a lot of it, a lot of the assumptions behind these um, stereotypes are simply not true. Um, a lot of holy activities were merely human inventions, and he never actually dared to take a run at um, his patron over his relics collection. Yeah. Um, but 
you know, he just realized, mm, no. <laughs> Have you been to Europe, seen the relics uh, all that, over the place? Good. The finger bone right? of St. John the Baptist. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was... <laughs> Who thought at that time to get that bone? <laughs> yeah, evidently which somebody did. Bone? And, I mean, look at the fabulous container in which it's housed, right? That's, quite sad. that's the yeah. thing. Um, yeah. It's not, it's not peculiar to Europe, because no. the Church of St. Anne ah. de Beaupre has uh, Virgin Mary's mo mother's mother's uh, elbow or shoulder, you know, little thing that you can do, too. So. Oh, no kidding. That's yeah. higher up the RT. Yeah. Oh, yeah it's right up there. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, interesting, right? Okay, it's kind of a plague all over the place, huh? <laughs> well, you would think that yeah. it's mostly happened over there because they're yeah. into that slowly. Yeah. But it happens here, too. Okay, well, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We were in one church, mm -hmm. Catholic, Catholic, Catholic Cathedral, where yeah. they, they thought they had the, the bones of the three wise men. <laughs> That's special. <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> so that's holy activities. Other, other holy activities. Luther came to see her. They're just a distraction. Um, whether or not they were man-made, they, they just distracted us. Pilgrimages being a great example of that, right? In Luther's day, people traipsing all over the place to um, see the holy sites and... Um, collect the indulgences along the way, which was another problem. Um, a lot of the things in that holy system actually <clears throat> generated benefits to you. And um, uh, do you know about the, the sacred steps, the holy steps in, in Rome? Uh, I didn't realize they were, they were only reopened this Easter season for the first time in almost 300 years. They've been, they've been covered with boards because they're so badly worn. Um, but the Vatican cleaned them all up and opened them for this Easter season this year. So there you are, just like in Luther's Day. You know, you climb up the steps on your knees, and here's the best part. You get an indulgence for doing oh. so. <laughs> Did you know they're still granting indulgences? Yes, they are. Yeah, yeah, this is from the Internet, and, um, and this is exactly what it says. Um, you know, you, you do these things, you, uh, you meditate on the Passion and recite the Creed, the Our Father, a Hail Mary, one glory be, and another prayer, go to confession, receive communion, and down at the bottom, um, you get your indulgence, plenary indulgence, which is also applicable to the dead, so if you don't need it. So is this cost? Is there a cost to this? No. Oh, no. so then you just no. have to do those works just, to get that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then you can That's transfer right. them over to the right. yep. one of you know, your dead relatives. Our grandma, she cool. was yep. wild, so we could save yep. her. Where are we signing right. up? <laughs> so, I mean, it, yeah, exactly. It's a self-interested thing, right? Yes. That's what yes. Luther's coming to realize. Yes. This whole system that says... Holy things are these things. Everything else is over here. He kind of wants to blow up that whole system. And the key to it is actually theological, not just that those things are abusive and misleading, but the core of what blows it up is realizing that we don't need to do any of that stuff to earn God's favor. It's a gift, right? Remember that picture from one of our earlier ones too? It's the gift of God, salvation, not by works not by anything we can do. So on the one hand, it's true. We don't owe God anything at all, right? And this picture, too, goes back to an earlier session. Um, we have a passive righteousness. Remember we talked about that? Don't have to do anything at all. We give nothing to God. We only receive its passive righteousness. But at the same time, once we receive that passive righteousness, that sets us free. Free from... Um, wickedness and sin, free to offer ourselves to God. From death to life, offering the parts of our body as instruments of righteousness, active righteousness. This is the, in the new self, this is how we want to live, insofar as we are the new self. <laughs> so this is Luther's insight. <laughs> Inspired by Walmart, I'm sure, right? Wherever we serve, can you complete the sentence? It's God who's called us to be there. And yeah, the shirt says, how may I help you? But build on that. That's how God does his work, too, through us.
Luther's great on this when he's talking about the Ten Commandments. Our parents and all authorities have received the command to do us all kinds of good. So we receive our blessings not from them, but from God, through them. Right? Creatures are only the hands, the channels, the means through which God bestows his blessings. Regardless what kind of blessing it is we receive. Luther, again, God works all things through you. Think about this. He milks the cow through you. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting thought? He performs the most servant-like duties through you. And all your greatest and smallest duties alike are pleasing to him. Kind of puts a different spin on milking the cow, doesn't it? <laughs> Is that part of God's work in the world? Hmm. Hmm. Well, think kingdoms, right? It's not part of his right-hand kingdom, really, to do all that kind of stuff. But it certainly does provide for the needs of us and all people in our ways. Keeps the whole creation running, all that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. Again, Luther traces it all back. It's a biblical view. Um, even talking about slaves, boy, again, if hard cases make um, interesting experiments. What about slavery? Paul says, obey your earthly masters in everything, not only while being watched and to please them, but wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever the task, throw yourselves into it as done for the Lord and not for your masters. So are you doing it for him? Yes. Is he doing it through you? Also, yes. It's all combined, whichever way we're looking at it, right? Well, and it's also not saying that Paul is supporting slavery. No. He's not saying you should own slaves or that you should you know, support that system of slavery. No, but that's another whole question. But yeah, <laughs> no, but it's, yeah, it, yeah. Again, that not usurping what was in place, but if you are a right. slave. Right, that's right. Yep, yep. He says it, uh, in a text I don't have up here, um, from First Corinthians, whatever condition you find yourselves in, yeah. stay there, because yeah. that's where the Lord has put you. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not Wal well, Walmart too. Yeah, I <laughs> yeah. 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 Come on, you can leave. So, yeah. Yeah. Can you? <laughs> Without the eyes of faith, the only thing I see is you. Right? You're just another person. That's what I see. You're a Walmart greeter. You're yeah. The guy milking the cow. You're the guy driving the garbage truck. You're the, you know, the woman giving me my flu shot at Rexall. Um, but with the eyes of faith, I see God serving me, or flip it around, God needing my service through you. Right? Matthew 25. Um, whatever we do, look at all the me's in there, Jesus saying, right? Whatever you did, you did it to me. All these things, and all these spheres of life. We had no idea it was him, but there he was. And lots of texts, when we have this lens on, we see the same thing as we look at them too. In the beginning of Acts, Luke talks about his first book having concerned all that Jesus began to do and to teach. What's the implication about his second book now? It's continuing. It's what Jesus continues to do and to teach. As Luke tells the story of the church. That's Jesus' ongoing work. Absolutely, yes. Or, you know this passage, I'm sure, from Matthew 10. He who receives you, receives me. Right? And then he also ties that in to the relationship between himself and the Father. Um, John 14. I say to you, the one who believes in me will do the works I do. And we'll do greater works than these, because I go to the Father. Now, I guess here, yeah, <laughs> the, the pace is smaller than the copy. Jesus is actually talking about it the other way around, isn't he? He's saying the paste is greater than the copy, because I'm out of here. But there's going to be a whole bunch of you. Or Paul in Colossians, again, I, I gravitate back to this passage so often. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh, I am completing what's lacking in Christ's afflictions for the church. There's an interesting one, huh? Not his afflictions to save the church, but his afflictions 
to build the church, to suffer with the church as the church does its work in the world. So the key element, serving others in love. And Luther is so good on this too. We should not run away from each other so that each of us tries to live for ourselves. Is that a word for 21st century Canadians? Hey. Instead, we should stay with each other in all kinds of different stations, <coughs> right where God has put us, and serve each other. Yeah. So when you get married, you get married under God. So, yeah. So, you know, is that kind of God's way of saying, you know, like, um, persevere in a relationship? <laughs> hmm. In terms of stay where you are then, if he's put you there? Yeah, and, or, you know, obviously if there's, like, uh, extenuating circumstances like abuse or something like that, then uh, maybe yeah, yeah, there's yeah. the possibility of, you know, retreating from that. But, um, I don't know, the way I I see what you that, mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interesting. We were just talking about this in one of our classes last week. Um, Luther intervened in a case where there was abuse within a marriage and uh, he intervened with the civil authorities to say, um, you know, this guy's beating his wife to a pulp. Um, you need to act here and allow them to divorce, even though, you know, normally in 16th century Germany that was not cool, right? Yeah. But um, uh, so it, he, he would he would recognize circumstances where where protecting people in danger do require people to run away from each other. So, you know, again, we can misapply this or push it too far, I think, but in general terms, he's saying we don't live for ourselves, right? And so in general terms, yes, the people that we're yoked together with in marriage or who are in our family or who are in our congregation, huh? We should not run away from each other to, you know, and lots of levels of application to this, right? But God is using us right where he's put us. And you saw this happening all around the world in every society. He recognizes, you know, things change um, from time to time and place to place. Um, a new king means a, a new law. When an empire is changed, its laws are also changed. But even so, he says, these divine offices continue and remain throughout all kingdoms, as wide as the world, and to the end of the world. These principles, in other, wise, in other words, remain. So here, a different paradigm. We were, remember we started out talking earlier, there's the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. Well, yeah, that applies in some circumstances. Um, other times, it's helpful for us to think about God working through the civil government and through the church. That's another paradigm. Well, here's yet another paradigm to think about how God does this stuff in the world. In Luther's day, there, this was commonplace to think of German society and European society too more broadly as being organized around these three different estates. This kind of maybe applies in our day not quite as well perhaps, but Luther recognizes the estate of the household and all the things that are part of that, right? Um, it's primarily, well, economics, so he would actually group occupations under the household too, in that sense. Um, what's it about? It's for providing resources to support life, to sustain life. So all the physical stuff that we need and all the people who provide it, all of that is sort of the estate of the household, okay? Then there's the estate of government, which is the framework that provide security and stability for all people. So again, there are some occupations that would be part of this estate, and some of the goals of some jobs, right, are to provide for that. Um, you know, the cop is not providing me with my groceries, but that doesn't mean his, he's not doing something useful, right? It's just a different kind of usefulness. That's the way these uh, different paradigms fit together, these different estates. And then there's the estate of the church, which embraces all of the others, or addresses all of the others anyway, with the word. Um, that's where we learn to uh, 
learn to know how God has cared for us in Christ and how we hear about his will for us. So some occupations are part of that estate as well, right? And here again is, is where Luther breaks down the pre-existing paradigms, which saw only this, <coughs> the, the uh, vocations in the church as being God-pleasing. And the rest of them, well, okay, you're just working for yourself, right? He says, no. <laughs> God is a great Lord and has many kinds of servants. All the estates and works of God, oops, are to be praised as highly as can be. And none of them should be despised. Sort of like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians, right? Varieties of gifts, varieties of service, varieties of working, but within all of them, it's the same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. Interesting how he stitches together those different phrases, right? To drive home the same point with variety. Ha! <laughs> At the same time, Luther's no dummy. He recognizes not all human work is pleasing to God, right? We can think of examples in our day. In his day, the examples that he listed in this connection were uh, robbery, usury, charging of interest, or ripping people off, in other words, right? And prostitution. Some things never change. Um, as well as that, he also thought the monastic orders were contrary to God's will. So, I don't know if we would quite lump that in today, but in his day that was certainly a problem. <coughs> he also knew that some people who hold good positions uh, abuse them. Mm -hmm. And that's a different kind of problem again, isn't it? Um, in all of God's offices and stations in life, there are many wicked men, but the station itself is good. It remains good, no matter how much people misuse it, right? It's not that being a cop is bad, it's that there are some bad cops. Or whatever occupation it is that we're talking about. And you'll find many bad women, many false servants, many unfaithful maids, many despicable officials and politicians, but being a wife, servant, maid, or politician, that's God's institution, work, and command. And his line at the end, I like that too. I don't think I highlighted it. Nope, didn't. The sun remains good, even though everyone misuses its light. <laughs> right? That's a good way to put it. Yeah. So it's not what we do that makes us specifically Christian. It's the way in which we do it. Whatever it is that we do. And again, a long quote here, but he's just got a picturesque way of framing things. If you're a worker... You'll find that the Bible has been put into your workshop, into your hand, into your heart. Right? It doesn't only affect you when you are at Bible study, or quest class, or in church on Sunday morning. Right? It teaches and preaches how you should treat your neighbor. So look at your tools, at your needle or thimble, your barrel, your goods, your scales, your yardstick, whatever it is you use in your vocation. Right? And you'll read this statement written on them. It's there everywhere you look. It stares at you. Nothing you handle every day is so tiny. It does not tell you this if you only listen. Well, what is he talking about? It goes on about that, right? You have as many preachers as you have, goods, tools, and equipment around you, and they're all crying out to you, what? This. Ooh. Ah. Friend, use me in your dealings with your neighbors just the same way you would want your neighbor to use his property in his dealings with you, right? Use me, whatever I am, as a Christian. Use it in service to God. Use it in service to God's people. <clears throat> Regardless of what we do in life. Um, yeah. An interesting example of that that I mm -hmm. experienced is um, doing um, a financial exchange of funds in a foreign country, and they used a calculator. Oh, yeah. And when they used the calculator, they were cheating me. Because... Uh -huh. I brought out uh -huh. my cell phone and went, no, nah, that's, that's quite different. Uh -huh. And it was interesting that it yeah. can appear to be a reasonable tool, but they have yeah. manipulated the tool to cheat. And so there you are. They, they were right. not using their tools. Mm. Right. You know, the right. Yes. Way. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Un unfortunately, we can learn from bad examples as well as yeah. good ones, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
still there are specific forms of love for every distinct vocation. And so maybe you remember um, in the small catechism, Luther has a, a household chart at the end of that. He just has collected up a bunch of Bible verses. It's not his own words, but he ties them together with all these different stations in life. So if you are you know, a husband, a wife, a parent, a servant, a worker, he provides you with Bible passages that will help guide you in the way in which you live in that station in life. Very practical kind of thing. Again, it's all tied to 16th century categories, which are not exactly our categories today in every case, but you can see behind the specific examples the intent, right, of helping people realize right where you are, you are doing God's work, whatever it is you're doing. And he says, yeah, even if you have to use force in your occupation, you can still do so in love. Um, so, yeah, if we have an office we must, or a government position, we must be sharp and strict. We must get angry and punish, right? Here in our vocation, we have to do what God puts in our hand and commands us to do for his sake. Outside of that, right, I can, I can be, and I should be, a nice guy. But if my vocation involves giving people speeding tickets, or sending them to jail, or you know taking taking marks off papers for <laughs> <laughs> this, that, or the other, <laughs> well then that's part of my vocation. And I mean I like to do that, but that's part of it. That's what God calls me to do. And if you take joy in doing that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Too much joy is the problem there, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. And he talks about that in uh, yeah, judges and criminals and in our family context as well, right? So the key element, Christians serve wherever they are because of Christ. And so here back to our Swedish friend Gustav again, right? <coughs> The old man is still under the law. He does not have the freedom to do as he likes. Only the children of God have loose reins. Isn't that an interesting way to put it? Mm -hmm. For they, that is we, do not misuse their liberty. But from the heart they aim to serve others and they rejoice in doing so. Wherever God has put us. It's not true that the new man is required to serve his neighbor. Interesting. And then, you know, any more than the the tree is required to bloom, or <laughs> math facts to be true. One may trust the children of God with freedom, he says. The result will be service to others, insofar as we are new creatures, right? The old Adam, mm, not so much. <laughs> so, in conclusion, it is a joyous thing to live in his kingdom, or maybe in both of his kingdoms. Um, I, I was fascinated, found this on the internet, a sketch for a stained glass work of Jesus and his disciples. Um, I really liked it in this context because it's under construction, <laughs> right? Not yet completed. The work has not come to an end. But, um, but even though we are still under construction, um, it's, it's lovely to think of ourselves as being with Jesus, under Jesus, doing his work everywhere where we are in life. Um, not because of the content of the thing that we're doing, but because we're doing it as part of God's work to serve him and to help other people. And that's what gives meaning and dignity even to the person who's milking the cow or changing the diaper or sweeping the street, or whatever it may be. So, we do serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Again, as we say in the catechism. So, thank you for your persistence and patience in tracking with me tonight and asking good questions and thinking hard about some of these things that um, I think can shed real light on the Lord's ways among us. Um, 
but also have limitations. Mm -hmm. And part of the value in coming to understand these things is seeing both of those together, mm -hmm. how they shed light, um, but, but also our human constructs. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, thank you. Thank Let's. You. Uh, thank you. Oh, I wasn't clapping. I was going to pray. <laughs> That's what that means for me. <laughs> but um, yeah, let, let's close with prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the ways that you work in the world. Uh, we can see you in some ways so very clearly in the church as you serve us with the gospel and call us to faith and deal with us with nothing but love and charity um, as your beloved children. At the same time, we see the fingerprints of your work in the world as you preserve the world and structure it and provide for the needs of all people and indeed for the whole creation itself through the work that you give us to do. Wherever you have placed us in life and whatever you call us to do, we pray that we could do it with joy, recognizing that we are your agents and instruments of your righteousness in the world as you care for people and love them. Help us to think carefully and well about these things. We're grateful for the insights that Luther had drawn upon uh, your word as he studied it deeply and tried to apply it to his own day. Give us grace to also see how you are at work in our day so that we can um, be involved in building your kingdom and bringing many others too to know you as the gracious and loving God. Be with us now as we go our homeward way. We put ourselves in your hands with joy and trust. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen. Thank you, Dr. Chambers. There you have it, session three of our four-part series, and um, you've gotten yet another taste of what seminary life is like. Um, it is, you can tell that Dr. Chambers is um, well adept. He is a professional in his craft. He knows what he's talking about. He's thoroughly researched. He's articulate um, and reminds us of the, the greater God that we find joy in proclaiming. Um, I hope you all have some takeaways from tonight. I know for me, I'm going to start giving indulgences back for donations <laughs> instead of tax receipts. Um, I, I think that makes good reasonable sense. That's a great learning. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm kidding. Uh, I do want to say a sincere thank you to all of you for being here and being part of the greater family of Concordia Lutheran Seminary. Um, it is our privilege to serve. I especially want to say thank you to Ellen and Vern and to Cindy tonight for um, helping provide the, the treats every week, um, faithfully and diligently, and that's part of your vocation, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And we thank God for the way that you do it with such joy. Um, oh, there's some food for the guys. Cool. Yeah, a, no, but she, she made something. Oh, Nancy, Nancy did too. I see. Yeah, and Nancy too. It is left, I think it's in the fridge. Okay. Mm. Well, good. Um, next week is the last session, session four. Um, again, I can't be here, but I'll be able to catch it in the replay um, afterward. But um, just want to say um, again, thank you and God's blessings on your way. And um, we appreciate the guys as well, and especially um, thank God for the gifts of His grace among us. Yes. Yes. Go in peace. Yes. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.